grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Part of God's word for our consideration this Easter day is written for us in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter, the first 10 verses. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, he rolled away the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards were so terrified of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead. And look, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. They hurried away from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. They approached, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go, tell my brothers that they should go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the gospel good news of our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, one thing about this shelter in place, safer at home, quarantine, quarantine yourself thing is that there seems to be a lot more sharing of social media and such. My inbox is just filled up every day. Maybe it's from people having too much time sitting in front of their computer monitor, right, or in front of their phones, and they just keep sending me stuff. I get recipes and pictures and links to videos, inspirational stories and messages, most of which are a little off doctrinally, but all kinds of stuff. I just can't even keep up with all of it. Then I get home and I turn on the TV, and it seems like right now half of the commercials are that local TV station advertising their news for tonight. You have to see this. Come and see this. You have to see this or you're going to miss out on something that is going to have a great effect on everyone's lives. Then I go back to my computer and turn it on to see all these other things that I just could not have lived without seeing. As people are advising me, oh, you got to see this. And it could be, you know, a gorilla making fun with, making, making friends with a little bunny rabbit. Or it can be like a, a politician saying something stupid or doing something stupid. Might be a star or a celebrity. And have you noticed how insubstantial those terms have become in our day? But they're up preaching to us about about everything we should know about economics and politics and, and how we should live our lives. And then three or four more links to a video or a picture, and you have to see this. It's got 17 bazillion hits. It's going viral. And hardly any of it seems to really be life-changing or even all that important and probably won't even be there a week or two from now. But now this morning, our God comes to us in our inbox, on our screen, or into our lives, and he says, no, no, really, you do have to see this. This is life-changing. This is important. This is all important. You have to see this. This is something that has held up after centuries of fact-checking all through history, and it's still the most important thing there is. Come and see. That's how those first visitors at the crack of dawn were invited by the angel. Come see the place where the Lord lay. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. And now 20 centuries later, that invitation, that message still hasn't lost any of the excitement. None of it has worn off as we read in Matthew's gospel. And as we see Matthew's account, our God our gracious God grabs each one of us by the hand and practically drags us along. Come on, you have to see this. Come and see. This is life-changing. Come and see Jesus has risen just as he said. Come see. Jesus has risen. And the way Matthew's gospel here records this most important event in all of history, the economy of words is just amazing. 
just a couple words to tell us the time, a couple words to tell us the place. Two of the ladies are mentioned, just, I think so, in keeping with the Old Testament scriptures, we could have this attested to by the mouth of at least two witnesses. Just a real brief description of this huge earthquake, just like the one when Jesus died. Only this one's because the angel came down and rolled away the stone. And then a brief description of said angel. The guards, so beside themselves, they're on the ground like dead men, completely out of it. And then the facts, stated in the simplest words possible. He is not here. He has risen. Come see. Now go. That's it. Just the facts, ma'am. Everything else is outside. This is like someone talking excitedly, someone who's run up to you with the greatest news ever, and all they can do is spit out just the really most important essentials, and that's what we have here, just the essentials. Nothing takes away from the main point. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen from the dead, of course, right? I mean, the gospel writers seem to take this almost for granted. But the point here is something that many people forget. Jesus is risen from the dead. You cannot have Easter without Good Friday. There needs to be the cross, that suffering and death of Jesus. There's a cross involved, a death, death that, like all of God's holy word says, is always a consequence of sin. And I think people tend to miss that on Easter. Easter's so nice. Look at the pretty flowers. And, oh, here, it's going to be fun to have this egg hunt with the kids. And, and oh, you look nice in your new Easter dress. And, and, oh, I can't wait to get into that basket of candy. Maybe we'll sing some rousing songs of joy. And if we're lucky, put that obligatory hour in, in the pew, right? But then comes this idea of death, sin, the cross, God expects something. God demands, and then it's not really fun anymore. Because then we have to talk about guilt and sin, and people don't want to talk about that. See, our society has kind of a funny way of handling that. It's called a lack of individual accountability, a lack of personal responsibility. Blame it on someone or something else, always. It's not my fault, ever. The naughty child, the cheating spouse, the hardened criminal, the drunk who misses the turn and crashes, someone who's addicted to some kind of a substance or any kind of sin. It's always blamed on someone or something else. Oh, oh the, it, it was because uh, I didn't have the right kind of upbringing or, or the, the, the social system just wasn't right for me or the education system kind of let this person fall through the cracks. Or maybe it's the government's fault. They didn't have enough warnings on this. There weren't signs up to say not to do that. Or they didn't make my life good enough, so I had to do these things. But it's always someone or something else. And it's amazing how easily we fall into that kind of thinking, isn't it? Well, yeah, my spouse or my kids drove me to have this outburst of anger. I tried to be nice, but this person just wouldn't let me. I, I just had to respond in this way. Well, the government uses my tax money so foolishly, it doesn't even make any sense to report all my income. And it goes on and on through whatever we do, what up to the littlest white lies we think are so harmless for us, or the ticky-tackiest little sins that we think aren't really that big a deal, but every one of them is a sin. Even though rationalizing is a way of life for us, making excuses, God does not play that game at all. He holds people directly responsible. With him, there's accountability. His word says, the soul who sins will die. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And there is no one who does good, not even one, and the wages of sin. God doesn't let people off the hook. He can't. He's God. He's absolutely, perfectly, holy, just, and righteous. But fortunately for us, he's also the God of all mercy and all grace. And this all-wise God, 
came up with and carried out a plan to fulfill all his righteousness and justice and still express all his love and grace. The plan that had God's son come down here and take full responsibility and pay the full price for all of our sins. That God the son did by becoming one of us, by living a life of perfect obedience and then paying the one and only price high enough to take away our sins. That took Jesus, the Son of God, suffering and dying. That was Good Friday. This is Easter Sunday. Now that stone slab where they put our crucified Savior, it's empty. That tomb of the God-man Jesus who had been crucified, vacant. No one's there. Come see, Jesus is risen. The earthquake calls attention to it. The guards who, who probably initially thought this is the easiest duty they could possibly pull. I mean, how hard could it be to keep a dead person in their tomb? And yet they were not up to that, were they? As now the angel comes down and rolls the stone away, not to let Jesus out, but to prove that he's already gone. All of it proof positive that Jesus had risen. Come see. Jesus has risen. The most important thing ever, the empty grave, the risen Savior. It means everything. It means Jesus really is and always was God, just like he said. It means when he died up there, he said it is finished. It really was. That payment was accepted for all of our sins. It means the greatest of all victories, and not just for Jesus, but for all of us, because that was our sins, our guilt, our hell, our death that was hanging around Jesus' neck when he got nailed to the cross, when he was up there yelling out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he was saying, it is finished. And now, when he walks away from the grave, no longer dead, there's nothing hanging around his neck. Our, our, our guilt, our sin, our death, our hell, it's all gone. All of it disappeared. Just like John says in his first epistle, this is why the Son of God appeared, to destroy the works of the devil. And that is exactly what happened when Jesus rose. The works of the devil, using the guilt of sin and the terror over death and hell, to, to, to use them as his awful weapons, that's gone. That got blown up like one of those old demolished, condemned buildings you see and they blow it up with dynamite and it just falls into that pile of dust. When Jesus rose, the devil's empire crumbled into dust. The punishment for sin, gone. The guilt of all our sins is erased by that infinite price of the blood and death of the Son of God. What leverage can the devil use against us anymore? Even his most feared weapon, right? Death. And who gets, who gets out of that one? Who walks away from that one? It sounds like one of these, I, should, I don't want to say dad jokes. Well, yeah, these dumb dad jokes. That some of us weird dads say when we got the kids in the car and you drive past the cemetery. Oh, look, kids, the cemetery, right? Know how many, know how many dead people in there? All of them. Well, not anymore. The Savior who took on everything the devil could dish out smashed through even that barrier, even death. Like in the movies, right? The Westerns, the, the guy's shooting, and, and you're counting the, the shots from the bad guy. One, two, three, four, five, six, and you know he's out. He can't do anything anymore. Here the devil shot everything he had into Jesus, and now the gun's empty. Jesus has risen just as he said. This should not have been a surprise to anyone. It shouldn't have surprised those ladies coming to the tomb. It shouldn't have surprised his disciples. It shouldn't have surprised anyone. This is what Jesus always was talking about. Even in the Old Testament, all these prophecies about him told this. And then as he stood and talked with people and told them face to face, this is the point. This is what I'm all about. Sometimes it wasn't so obvious that Jonah won right just like Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days. But something in there should have rung a bell. Or that destroy this temple, and in three days I'll build it up again. Okay, maybe those weren't as obvious, but how about like in Matthew 16, when he told everyone there, from that time on, 
Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law and be killed and on the third day be raised again. Could he have made it any clearer? How could they have forgotten those mournful women barely able to see through their tears as they're coming to embalm someone who's, who's not even there anymore? Those frightened disciples standing behind the locked and closed doors because they're so afraid. The people in our day, almost out of their minds in panic, thinking that somehow this God isn't going to come through on his word to take care of us always in the best way like he has promised to do for us. Somehow, somewhere, people aren't remembering what Jesus had said, right? So there's pain and there's, there's fear and there's doubts and there's worries that doesn't have to be there. These people don't have to know that. Seems like the angel here is shocked, surprised. What are you doing here? If you're looking for Jesus, why are you here? This is a cemetery. This is a cemetery. This is where dead people stay. Remember this Jesus? He promised to be alive. And of course Jesus kept his word. Jesus is God. God has to keep his word, and that's even more great news for us because this Savior God who kept his word in suffering and dying for us and then rising for, for to prove that it, his mission was accomplished, he's made some more promises too. Promises to be with us always to the end of the age. Promises, as he says, because I live, you also will live. Ever see a possum? Not exactly considered one of the most intelligent creatures on the face of God's earth. And here's another one of my bad dad jokes as, as we see a possum in the road. I'll say, hey, kids, why did the chicken cross the road? To show the possum it could be done, right? Possums aren't that smart. But one thing about them really is smart, really is wise. If there's a hole and it's got a set of tracks going into it and none coming out, a possum won't go in there. But if there's a set of tracks going into that hole and coming out of it, then the possum will be comfortable going into it. That's how it is for us with death. Now, we don't necessarily get to choose whether or not we go into that hole, but we can see the Savior's tracks that went into it are also coming out of it. It can't hurt us anymore. Even that ugly enemy death is for us nothing more than this sleep from which we will wake to a new and perfect morning for all of eternity, just like Jesus said, just as he said, which is why everyone in this account, and the more you read of the Gospels, the more you read of the Bible, the more you see this, this same phrase coming up again. But everyone here is told, don't be afraid. It's an imperative, a command. This is a special one. This is the stop it imperative. Knock it off with being scared. Over and over, Jesus and his messages are saying, don't be scared. You have the Savior who always is true to his word. That no matter how much the odds seem against you, no matter what things seem to be falling apart in your life, this is the Jesus who always keeps his word, and that means you're still winning because Jesus won for us. If he kept his word doing this hardest thing, paying for our sins, removing that barrier between us and a holy God, we can know for sure that the rest of these promises are a piece of cake for him that we can count on him to do what he says and be with us always in all circumstances. Through this pandemic, through whatever situation, health or otherwise, shows up in our lives, that we can count on him to turn even the worst things in life into hidden blessings on his perfect path, his perfect way. We know, as he's promised us, that we can turn to him in any time of any need and count on his perfect solutions. All for exactly the same reason. Come see. And then go. Live. Tell. Live in that peace and excitement because Jesus has risen just as he said. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having listened to the wonderful word of our holy God, we now have the opportunity to declare the faith he's given us. This morning we do that using the words of the Nicene Creed. 
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. <laughs> 